Welcome everybody to today's webinar on purposeful leadership and welcome back after the summer. So our last webinar in this leadership series was on evolving leadership on the 24th of June with Dr. Lou Drake and Munish Data, and that is still available on the website. And today I'm being joined by Dr. Victoria Hurth, who's an Associate Director here at CISL and most recently Assistant Professor at Plymouth, and also Ben Kellard, who is our Director of Business Strategy. So, so welcome, Ben. Thank and you. welcome Victoria who's who's joining us rem remotely and welcome to all of you we've had over 400 people sign up for this webinar and thank you for making the time in your busy schedules to be with us we've already received questions from a number of you in advance which we will be addressing at the end of our initial presentation and you will see that there is also the functionality to have a conversation in the chat as we go along and also submit questions for us to ask at the end. So a couple of points just to cover off quickly before we get going, um, in addition to that. Firstly, a recording of this webinar will be available afterwards. So welcome to those of you who are joining us um, by listening to the recording. And secondly, the next webinar in our leadership series is gonna be on the 6th of November, where we'll be looking at leadership development in the 21st century, and we're very excited about that too. All right, and we'll be referencing a couple of um, recent reports from CISL during this webinar that are available on our website, and those include rewiring leadership and also rewiring the economy. So with no further ado, let's get started. Um, and in this session, we're really gonna be looking at a couple of things. So firstly, we're gonna be looking at what we mean by purposeful leadership and how to achieve it. Secondly, we're really gonna be unpacking the link between purpose and the definition of purpose, uh, leadership, and also how purpose and leadership are inextricably linked with sustainability and sustainability leadership. So that's what we're gonna be kicking off with in the first 25, 30 minutes of the webinar, and then it's very much over to you and your questions. So with no further ado, Victoria is gonna kick us off. And uh, Victoria, I want to start by asking you what we need, mean by purpose, because this was something that we began to explore in the last webinar in June. Why is it so powerful for individuals and organizations? And what does it mean for leadership? So, so firstly, in good academic tradition, Victoria, can you kick us off by actually defining purpose for us? Okay, yes, absolutely. Before I do, in good academic tradition, um, I just want to make a couple of points. Um, firstly, that that's a really good question, Zoe, because unless we really, and that's obviously very academic, but unless we understand something and pin it down, we can't hold it to account, we can't work out how to deliver it, and we really also, in this respect, can't understand the leadership required. Um, so it's really important to, uh, to, to keep us on track if we really want to deliver purpose. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so that's that's the first point to make. Um, and then moving on to the, the, the next slide, um, just to outline some of the research that we've been doing on um, purpose. So um, yes, here, here we go. Here are some of uh, my lovely colleagues. Um, and we've been looking at the, the what, the why, and the how of purpose in order to start to really pin down this this idea of you know what is it um get the basics in, in place obviously lots of stuff being done and this is our contribution to it brilliant so um thank you victoria and as you said this piece of research comes actually at a time where we're seeing lots and lots of real uh, interest in purpose related to organizations i picked up this copy of the economist from the train station this morning. I don't know why they were giving out an old one, but this, we've seen Financial Times, we've seen a lot of articles. So moving back to your particular piece of research, what did you conclude in this piece of research? Well, we um, interviewed, having interviewed a range of leading organizations um, in the area and also looking at a range of other research, we concluded the definition you can see on the screen now. So um, the purpose is an organization's meaningful and enduring reason to exist that aligns with long-term financial performance, provides a clear context for daily decision-making and unifies and motivates relevant stakeholders. So 
we, we felt that that sort of gave enough detail to, for people to really understand what, what we mean and what the essence of purpose is. And I just want to pull out one word uh, there particularly, which is the word meaningful. Um, because by meaningful, we mean about being aligned to the service of others and particularly the long-term well-being of, of humanity. Um, so meaning is at the heart of purpose and I will go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Brilliant. OK, so thank you for that fantastic definition there to set us up. Now, this feels quite different from the long held view and, and what, what I think we'd say is the old view of companies maximising profit for shareholders, no longer being the core reason that, that an organisation will exist. So this is a big change, this, this shift towards purpose. Yeah, it's it's a massive, massive change at the, at the very logic of an organisation and of, of economics, really. So we, we can't underestimate it. Um, I mean, what it means is that profitability still is key. So first thing to say, we're not saying profits are bad or they shouldn't be. You know, they are absolutely core, core to delivering purpose. But it's not about profit maximisation. Profitability, not profit maximization. So what it means is that profits become an enabler of delivering your purpose and a really good marker of your success, but not the point of your business. Um, and that means um, also, and this is quite an important detail, that whereas at the moment it's assumed that people will maximize their own well-being through the market, and it's not the role of the biz of businesses to sort of get involved with that, just to sort of read what people are buying and then respond to that. Uh, but actually, purpose is about an organization taking direct responsibility for delivering well-being and orientating their whole operations uh, towards that goal. And we've seen um, Larry Fink, um, the CEO of the biggest investment management company, BlackRock, um, saying this recently in terms of that society is expecting that companies deliver directly on social issues and don't, as would have in the past or currently, leave that up to government. Um, so it's a major shift, but massive, massive opportunity if we if we get this right. Um, and the Cambridge Impact Leadership Model, as we know, um, and for those that don't know, puts purpose really at the centre of aligning a profitable business with a bright future for humanity. Fantastic. So this leads me into this next slide and the next question, which is um, you know, the reasons for this shift towards profit and why is purpose important to businesses today? Yeah. OK, thank you, Zoe. Yeah. What, what, why, why are people making this shift? It's, it's such a big shift. Um, we've been doing it for a long time the other way. Why? Yeah, I, absolutely. Well, um, the, re the reason that we found, and, and here we summarise five of the reasons, um, um, is that basically business is facing multiple pressures. Um, and one might say that uh, most of those or a lot of those pressures are coming from having been overly focused on profit maximisation for a few people. Um, and so purpose comes along and therefore, funnily enough, seems to address many if not all of these really deep issues that business are facing um, so yeah the five that you can see up there uh, that we pull out in our report are firstly to maintain and increase legitimacy in business so that's really the social license to operate you know why society lets a business exist in the first place to attract and motivate and retain talent to drive strong customer and stakeholder relationships to increase directly the employee's psychological well-being and to increase business performance. Fantastic. Well, those those are pretty powerful. And I know that in addition to sort of academic research, including yours there, there's also, as you referenced, been a number of sort of practitioner reports which highlight. Yes, yeah, there are um, a number of reports that really uh, pull out the sort of the detail of, of, of how purpose can positively affect business. Um, so we see um, some examples here, um, two examples. Firstly, um, on the left, you can see Edelman's Good Purpose study. Um, perhaps the, the key piece of information here is what's circled at the bottom there, um, which says when quality and price are equal, social purpose ranks as the most important factor in selecting a brand. And secondly, on the right, we have some stats from the global survey uh, by LinkedIn, um, and that showed a connection between purpose and financial revenue growth. 
um, the, the key statistic here is 85% of purpose-led companies have experienced revenue growth, whereas over the same period, 42% of non-purpose-led companies experienced revenue reductions. So the key takeaway here is that commercial success and serving society's long-term good can be highly compatible. I've lost sound, Zoe. You're back. Great, great. All right. Well, <laughs> good to glad you can hear us back. So I was just saying that those are really compelling data points, Victoria. And why is this? Now, how can purpose be so powerful for business? Well, you know, obviously purpose is a rich topic and we've got a short period of time, but I'd just like to pick out, um, I think, the two underpinning pieces of the puzzle of purpose that really gives it its power. So um, firstly, when you look at how people talk about purpose, one of the first ways, so one of two ways, the first way that people talk about it is that it's about um, generally doing good for all people. Uh, particularly for stakeholders and not just shareholders. So we saw what was coming out of the US Business Roundtable uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, echoing that and also echoing what uh, Larry Fink said on purpose. Um, so in this way, a lot of what some of these um, people are saying can sound a lot of, like what we know as stakeholder theory. So the picture on the slide here is Ed Freeman, uh, the father of stakeholder theory and a really lovely man, um, and he states here, um, he's also written a lot on purpose, but we're just talking here about his stakeholder theory, um, that the idea that business is about maximizing profits for shareholders is outdated and doesn't work very well. The task of executives is to create as much value as possible for stakeholders without resorting to trade-offs. So here, the responsibility of companies is to serve the good of stakeholders and by doing that, they will ultimately benefit. So this is also aligned with a long-term perspective of business value creation um, and also uh, what is known as enlightened shareholder value. Um, but the real, you know, at the heart of, of why doing good is important um, is because what we, we know about humanity, that as humans, we're actually geared to serving the well-being of others. So I'd just like to take a moment to just reflect on that. And this links back to what I was saying about meaningfulness and meaning being at the heart of purpose. Um, so Viktor Frankl, uh, drawing from ancient philosophy, summarizes this really well, this core human motivation. Success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. And this is Viktor Frankl's definition of, of meaning and for him a, a, a purposeful life is a meaningful life and these things are, are highly connected. So we're hardwired to want to have meaning. We don't want to have meaningless lives. Um, it's, it's totally core cool to us. So organizational purpose is about connecting a company with that motivation um, and this is what unlocks a lot of the power of purpose so again that's a massive shift for business because as we probably probably know um, businesses are generally based on the assumption that we're mostly driven by self-interest and money and that's quite hardwired into business thinking um, so um, and I'd further just just finally suggest on on this point around the first point around business doing good um, is um, that global humanity, I'd say, probably has already an implicit shared purpose at the very largest level, um, which is to achieve long term well being for all. Um, and if that isn't our shared project, then what is? So, answers on a postcard. Um, so, the question uh, for leaders when thinking about defining their purpose is how can their organization uniquely contribute to that? Um, in relation to other people in the in the marketplace, and that's where organisation purpose, organisational purpose sits, and what underpins it. So that was the the first key point of what gives purpose its power is um, yeah. fantastic. So so that's the sort of the profound first point in terms of doing good for others. Um, yeah. What's what's your second key point? 
Okay, so the second way that purpose is talked about, sometimes totally in abstract to anything around, uh, around what I just talked about there, um, is the purpose is about having a really clear goal that galvanizes and energizes Victoria, we've lost your sound. Can people on the chat just let us know whether you actually can still hear Victoria? We'll just sort out this momentary glitch. It doesn't matter what kind of goal it is. It doesn't have to be about doing good. So in that way, the mafia could be seen to be purpose-driven. However, we in fact uh, find that purpose is a unique combination of both these things. So firstly, it's a North Star that all stakeholders, no matter where they see, or where they sit in the constellation, they can see this North Star and they can understand it and they can make decisions in relation to it. And at the same time, purpose is about that deep motivation that hum human motivation to walk in the direction of that North Star because it is deeply meaningful and motivational because it's about serving the good of others. So for purpose to be a North Star, it's important to note that um, it, it has to be specific. It can't just be too general. Um, so it's got to be about, therefore, about certain groups that you're serving, whilst, of course, taking care of your stakeholders that help you to achieve that purpose. Um, and that was a point that Professor Eccles made on the front page of the FT recently, you might have seen. Um, but of course, purpose, therefore, is about uh, both these things. Um, so purpose cannot just be about serving all stakeholders, and it can't just be about any old ambition. Just gone. Fantastic. So thank you, Victoria, and, and thank you for mentioning that other recent uh, piece that covered off of purpose in the, in the Financial Times that um, people on the webinar might have seen. Super. So you've effectively unpacked the first piece in terms of purpose. Now, now the second piece in terms of connecting purpose with leadership and, and what purpose means for leadership. Can you, can you take us into that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I said, purpose is a rich top topic and it really transforms what we need to think about in terms of leadership. A lot of that thinking has already been done, but it's about bringing it together and being really clear. Um, and obviously, this is a short webinar, so I'm just going to outline three key areas. Um, and these align um, very much and build on uh, uh, what's in the Cambridge Impact Leadership Model, um, which you can see here. Um, so that bottom part, the leadership we need, the three areas there are guided by purpose, cultivating the necessary thinking, values and practice, and ref being reflective and adaptive. So I'm going to mention three areas around purpose and how they uh, interact with, with those points. So the first point um, I'm going to mention is about being brave, bold and humble. This is the sort of leadership that we're talking about. Um, and, and just to say that this and, and all these points really are about this bringing humanity back into business. So that underpins a lot of this thinking and particularly this point here. So any, for any company who's about to set out on a purpose journey or start a purpose driven business, um, but particularly if you're transitioning, it's a long, difficult and uncharted ro road for change. I mean, any change is difficult. This is massive. Um, and so we had a lot through our research, people talking about the need for brave and vulnerable leadership. So think about Marks and Spencers. You walk into a shop now and you'll still see things that do not fit plan A, that are not very sustainable at all. However, we're OK with that. Um, and why? Um, because from the very beginning, the leadership was very clear that m and are not perfect, that it would take many years to implement their purpose intent, but the, and that they would get lots of things wrong along that journey, but that they were nonetheless 100% committed to that in purpose intent because there was no plan B. There is no plan. Uh, and so this approach, this brave, vulnerable leadership is reflected in the Cambridge Impact Leadership Model in their emphasis on being reflective and adaptive, because you really have to be tuned in in order to be able to be brave and vulnerable and open out to your stakeholders rather than being closed and isolated. So that's point number one. Point number two is about being clear that this is, this is about um, leadership that, it, that is not heroic. It's not about having all the answers. It's about setting a frame 
I'm not making all the decisions. And purpose really is a frame at the very highest level. It's a clear, bold, and uh, motivating frame. Um, and therefore, it actually, one of its key benefits is that it allows you to take out lots of that micro decision making and strategy because you're not trying to stop people being self-interested and you're not trying to dictate what they do. You're trying to enable them to, to achieve the purpose. So, um, so basically, leaders need to be really astute to how much guidance they need to give in relation to the purpose. So they need enough so that that frame is clear enough and that people know how to interpret it, and it is relatively consistently interpreted at that high level. But if they give, um, and they can do that through written statements, stories, proof points, but if they give too little, um, then um, people don't really understand what the purpose uh, is, but um, if they give too much, then they basically end up being, uh, feeling like they have no ownership, that they can't connect and really lead that purpose. They're being led rather than being enabled to lead. So again, reflexivity and adaptability from the Cambridge leadership model is critical to this. Um, so yeah, this is about leadership in context. Okay, um, so finally, third point is to focus on the purpose, really focus on the purpose and people's emotional connection with it because the answers are there. If your purpose is truly meaningful, um, and contributes to the well-being of others, then leading for purpose is about making those connections between um, what people do in their work and achieving that purpose on behalf of others, you know, really reinforcing those connections. And academics like Bartlett and Gauchel, and this was actually back in the 90s, a great article they wrote, is that a leader's core role, so it's especially senior leadership, their core role is to help employees and stakeholders connect emotionally with the organizational purpose, not to dictate strategy. So as a leader, the amount of time and energy you put into both yourself and others, being able to think through how their work delivers on the organizational purpose and what that therefore means for the good of others, um, the more that that can be done, the stronger the purpose will come to life and be lived. Fantastic. So, so thank you very much, Victoria. I think that that last section in particular, how to lead for purpose, was was really powerful in showing the connection between purpose and leadership. And just to note, any of the the references that are made in this webinar are, are at the back of the webinar. So, if you want to dig into some of the articles that Victoria mentioned, super. So, we've heard from Victoria in terms of the connection between purpose and leadership. I now want to hand over. Um, for a few minutes to Ben Kellard, who's going to take us from purpose and leadership through to the relationship between purpose and sustainability. So tell us about that, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I guess last year I was really struck as I was hearing more and more about the purpose debate and looking into it and talking to great people like Victoria. So there's huge potential with purpose, but like a lot of the leaders I was working with, it, um, were saying, how do these fit together? Are they compatible? If so, how? And so on. And so as I was talking to purpose and sustainability experts over last year, they have shared that same impression, that it was unclear how all this fits together. So at the end of last year, I basically got essentially a dream team of experts together from both the purpose side of the debate and the sustainability side of the debate to thrash this out. And what we came up with, you can see the great group there, many of who seem very familiar. Um, we came up with this definition, which is, so a sustainable purpose um, is a meaningful, enduring reason for an organization to exist that provides solution to global challenges, like the SDGs, or benefits society, but in a way that sustains the social and environmental systems we rely upon. And so that's where we kind of got to. So building on the great work of Victoria, I'm delighted that she was able to, to be part of that. Um, you can see the definition. And so I think what that's doing is it's delivering a sort of crucially a couple of other additional benefits to purpose in isolation, which is, I think, helping businesses say, well, what do we, you know, given that the level of the change taking place in society is exponential. So is our business, our business model and our purpose resilient and relevant in that future? And that's what is helping answer that question, I think, by bringing right. sustainability to bear with purpose. So you're combining both that relevance and resilience into the future with that positive articulation of a business's contribution um, towards it. And I think that's where the power of bringing these two ideas together. And we just felt that the group, that it was both inextricably linked, purpose and sustainability. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, where do the SDGs fit in all of this? Because obviously a lot of people, when they talk about 
purposeful leadership they mentioned the SDGs yeah we know from um, so as the research you can see here is showing that we know a lot of businesses are looking at the SDGs thinking what it means for them and that's not just here in Europe but across the world we're seeing that and and I think that that provides a really powerful tool the SDGs to help think about what the business model needs to look like into the future and think about well what would that business look like that purpose if it were delivering the SDGs to help both understand where the, if you like the big drawdowns on natural or social assets are but also crucially the contribution they can make to well-being as as victoria describes as this research shows as well that um and this comes only just from last uh, from this year which is that 34 percent of businesses and this is over a thousand global responses um are mapping sdgs against their future strategy and 46 percent are in the process of integrating the sdgs into their broader strategy so in, so it seems there's this um alignment opportunity between potentially bringing purpose into that um, above and beyond just looking at, um, at the SDGs. Deloitte did a piece of research a couple of years ago which, which found that they looked at the FTSE 350, so 350 biggest companies in the UK, and found that only um, it was 13 percent were both having an explicit purpose that was linked to sustainable development in some way, be that the sustainable development goal. So already we know it's quite a minority at the moment, but we also know a lot of companies are looking at this. Great, okay. So if a lot of companies are looking at this, what does, how, how do we make an organizational purpose fit for purpose? What's that look like? Good question. Well, I think one of the things that's, um, that CICL has already set out in the rewiring leadership are these characteristics um, of a, of a, that makes a fit for purpose. And so the first is that relevance to, to the nature and scale of the challenges we're facing. We sometimes call that evidence base. So that, as I was talking about, you're really thinking about what does the future hold? How does it, is it, is it addressing those exponential changes that we're facing, be that climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on? The other thing is that it's holistic, so it has to look really across the whole business. It's no good looking at just your media, you know, um, who you're buying or selling from, but right across from where you're buying raw materials, sourcing them, right the way through to how the product is used and disposed of. It needs to be authentic, coming back to what Victoria was saying, that it really needs to be, you know, people need to be walking the talk in the business. And I think particularly we've seen when businesses, particularly big businesses that have been profit focused, are shifting to a more a broader purpose. Everyone's watching and saying, okay, what are those moments of truth decisions where you're really evidencing that, that authenticity is important. And also I think that the purpose becomes prior to both the business model and strategy, it forms and underpins both. Um, and that's something we've seen when, when businesses are figuring out what their purpose is, often there comes that point where they realize that their business model isn't resilient in, in the future. And so we have to come back and say, well, what to, how does that need to be adapted to find a purpose which is relevant and resilient in that future? So it can then inform strategy, planning, and, and so on. And then finally, that it's owned across the organization. So it's not just been an executive team or the board, it's really seen as something owned, owned across the organization. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think an example of that might be, um, uh, so Olam are an interesting business. They're based out in Southeast Asia, huge, great um, agricultural business. And their purpose is to reimagine global agriculture and food systems. And they've underpinned that by saying they want to be regenerative and net positive in key areas like communities, agricultural techniques and the farmers. And so they're bringing that idea that us underpinning that purpose. So I think that's, a, that's something that struck Great. me. Fantastic. And, and thank you for that, because I was going to ask you to bring some examples to life of, of ones that you particularly like that you've mm. seen. Super. OK. So you've outlined five key characteristics there of how to have a, a, a purpose that is fit for purpose. Now, on, on the flip side, what are some of the pitfalls to avoid? So we've got a lot of people on the webinar who might be thinking about how they integrate a sustainable purpose into their organisation. Yeah. What, what are the watch outs? So I think there's probably three I'd pull out as sort of quite typical, um, if you like, um, pitfalls. I think the first is not engaging widely enough. And as um, Victoria was saying, as we're shifting from this idea that organizations are like big complex machines or cars with drivers who are the executive team, you know, pushing decisions through the organization, as we're shifting to more organic, agile, responsive organizations, I think it means that you need to engage the, the culture. And there's examples of where that's both bottom up, top down, inside out, outside in, and, and, and a combination of those work well. A lot of organizations are you know, going back to their original heritage. I mean, Unilever is an example of that, where their purpose of 
um, create, you know, making sustainable living commonplace echoes Lord Lever's making cleanliness commonplace that underpins, you know, the original Victorian soap business. Um, so, so there's definitely that, I think. Um, also, um, diluting these powerful ideas of sustainability and purpose and diluting them or maybe not understanding them well enough to say, how can they really inform that future direction of the business and having a robust evidence-based approach to thinking about the business's role in the future. And I think then finally is it can often get very fragmented and diverged across an organization. So you might have a I've seen you know purpose directors or sustainability directors and strategy teams who aren't talking to each other, aren't aligned. And so I think what this uh, so I think connecting those together so that it's really becomes one and the same, where you might then as a result of a purpose have roles and responsibilities for functions, but they're connected together. So it's really underpinning decision making at all levels of the organization. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so we've nearly come to the end of our talking. I'd, I'd like you to just yeah. um, also talk about um, really interesting to know. So you mentioned rewiring the economy, and, and, and rewiring the economy that, that a, a recent report that we published also yeah. brings in elements of, of purpose. What are what are the related tasks there? So, so I think the four tasks for business that's within rewiring the economy are, are great ways of avoiding those pitfalls. Yeah. So. We've already talked about the importance of aligning that purpose strategy um, and, and with sustainability. I think one just thing to add there is that often I think that from working with um, businesses, there's often that moment when you realize the current business model isn't fit for the future. So there is often a point where you need to engage the exec team and the board on saying, well, what is a relevant purpose and business model? How do we need to be moving towards that? Um, setting evidence-based targets as part of that, underpinning it like OLAM have done, setting evidence-based goals um, is, is really important. Task nine, which is about embedding it in working practices. Now, some working practices are more important than others depending on the business you're in. So if you're a product manufacturer, probably your new product development process is really important to make sure that those stage gates are reflecting the purpose in a meaningful way. Um, Reward and recognition is really critical. I think we're going to come on and talk a bit about that, but getting into people's personal objectives and building on what Victoria was saying, making sure it's clear enough as a frame, but leaving room for people to interpret and, and sort of and make sense of that. Um, and then finally playing that role of engaging externally. We know that a lot of organizations that are within systems, whether that's you know, pressures from capital markets or distribution channels, supply chains that are currently unsustainable and they need to play a role in shaping that to create a, a, where they can't fix these issues alone, whether that's deforestation, human rights, whatever. So playing yeah. that external progressive role. And the sort of final thing I think to mention there is that often people talk about trust and resilience as if, or trust and reputation, if it's something you can go after. I think as Victoria was saying that, I think it's also something that comes from doing other things. It's a result of being transparent being consistent um, and, and actually delivering you know, great products and services. So trust and reputation, I think, is something that's an outcome of doing these things. It's not something you go after as, as a goal on its own. Great, super. So lots and lots to un, um, consider there, and I'm sure people will be revisiting these great ideas. So final, your final owlish words of advice, <laughs> what, what would they be? So I guess just picking out a couple of other things, I, I, I did write a piece, a blog, looking at 10 questions to consider when aligning purpose, sustainability and, 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 and strategy. And I just want to draw out a few, I guess, is we've talked about the importance of um, engaging widely um, within the organisation. Uh, there's a big multinational that used an online platform to engage north of 70% of colleagues, um, which was really powerful. Um, Look at the importance of looking at the overall business, the whole of the value chain, um, and, and using evidence-based science to inform um, what's important and, and what the goals are. I think another thing is, is being clear about once you've got your purpose, what are the key strategic priorities or plays over the next sort of three to five years? Where are the big investments? Like, for example, for vertically integrating your supply chain more or going down a certification route. So that can provide real connections between functions so that, say, brands can draw on investments in the supply chain. Um, talked about that in, um, in creating space for innovation and interpretation by, by people in, in functions like in product development or, or, or marketing. Also building the capacity, particularly of key populations, they're going to have to take the lead on this first. Um, and that might be taking it to market, developing the products in the first place. And it's really important, I think, that that's done um, you, you do embedded in the business before you go shouting too much about it. Some businesses have been caught out by 
talking very quickly about their purpose without really delivering the goods because I think it's, get, it's doing these things, getting it into the organizational disciplines, which is where the heavy lifting is. And that's the bit where the, the performance is delivered, that's where the benefits are accrued, and that's also what's very hard for competitors to replicate as well. And I think once you're doing all that stuff, telling the story, you know, showing the metrics where you've got it, but also using storytelling to, to show the progress you're making along the way. Great, fantastic. And what a brilliant point to end on, telling a compelling story, always one of my personal favourites. Super. So. I am actually not going to cover off the key takeaways because I want to get on to the questions, but I think in summary, what we've done over the last uh, 30 minutes is we've taken you from um, definitions of purpose, connecting that to leadership, and then finally with you, Ben, talking about the connection between purpose and sustainability. So what I'd now like to do with no further ado, because we've got a lot of people on the call, is get us into our questions. Now, we did get a few questions in advance, so thank you to uh, people that, that submitted those. So I'm going to kick off with a couple of those. And um, so, sort of a, a first question, um, Victoria, which I'm going to uh, come to you on, if, if I may, is we had a, a question about, um, you know, how do you begin to identify purpose and meaning at an individual level? So, so what, what's, our, what's our starting point? Well, I, yeah, I would just refer back really to the to the point that I made earlier um, about that that warm glow, and, and so I, I don't know if people are um, are familiar with that sense of uh, warm glow that you get when you open the door for someone or pick something up for someone, um, and that's really the hard wiring that I talked about earlier in terms of you know humans wanting to serve others. So if you're going to start to identify purpose and meaning. For yourself or for others it's really starting to tune in to that to begin with and that can be from those little things that, that you do and really starting to realize that um it's then maybe thinking about some of those bigger issues that really drive meaning for you and that could be something you've had experience of like maybe you're you're, you're really concerned about uh, disabled people and their families because you've had a disabled person in your family or you really know about climate change and you're really concerned about it so focusing on those topics but the point is to really get beneath the topics to remember that this is about if you're human then you, you're per, being purpose driven is is about helping you know everyone so getting out to that broader level if you possibly can um, but I think it's about taking that time I'd say the first the beginning steps are taking the time to really think about what purpose means for you and what that feeling is and what it does for your life noticing it where it's not sometimes even apparent for example, like you, if you're doing a, some work, um, you might not realise that you, you're doing something meaningful. So try and unpick how you might be doing that. Great, that's, that, that's brilliant, thank you. Yes, and we all recognise that warm glow. It's when everyone can hear the <laughs> webinar right the way through. <laughs> Great, okay. So, so Ben, um, another question that we had, and um, which was a nice one, which was, what are some of your favourite purpose statements and, and why did they resonate with you? And, and this is just you personally. I asked you to consider some that you found. And we always want to give practical examples to, to people. So I thought, it would, I thought it was a good question. So have you got a few that Thanks. you could draw on? Yeah, a few. I mean, I'd still always like to see a lot more, but I think, and, and, and I think there's a whole clutch of what I call values-led businesses who have got some fantastic purposes, like um, seventh generation, which is around transforming the world into a healthy, sustainable, and equitable place for the next seven generations. And they make home care and personal care products. They're a US-based uh, company that have actually been acquired by Unilever. But also we're starting to see some of the, the big companies, um, big multinationals shifting towards the same purposes like Danone and DSM. So DSM um, have a purpose which is creating brighter lives for all. So they're interesting, their roots are in the mining industry, but they're now a science-based company looking to deliver solutions to health and nutrition, climate change, resource scarcity, energy needs. Um, using their science. So I think there's some interesting purposes there that have yeah, caught my eye. Great, lovely. Thank you for those examples. Um, and by all means, if there's anyone on the webinar that wants to, to throw in some examples that we can give to others for inspiration, then, then please do. Um, Victoria, I, I'm, I, we've had a question come in on the webinar just now, and I, I believe this was an area that you covered in your research as well. So I'd, I'd like to put this one to you, if I may. Um, it's around targets. So the question that we've had is, 
how do we find tangible concrete targets in the domain of purposeful leadership that can overlay traditional metrics? Um, and, and actually that, that aligns with a question that we also had in advance, which was around um, examples that you might have of reward strategies that shift the focus from short term to longer term performance results. So be interested to get your, your thoughts on, on, on those two related questions. Absolutely. And like Ben said before, it's purpose is not some fluffy, nice you know, thing that sits there. It's got to be made tangible. You need to have targets around it, even if some of those targets are, are more difficult than traditionally. Um, and yes, I think that, you know, that the, the question around, say, particularly um, uh, targets that might uh, interact with incentives is, is a really interesting question. So in the research that we did, um, uh, one organization was a large education provider that was there, there was more than one but uh, was a large education provider um, and they had um, centers that people would come in off the streets and then connect online and uh, um, engage in some online learning um, and previous to that and for a long period of time the people who ran those centers were uh, incentivized on how many people came through the door paid up and logged on to the system um, and that's, you know, I'm sure people will realize that's a common sort of way of incentivizing people in an organization. They then went through a very profound purpose journey where they wanted to focus absolutely on the well-being of those people that they serve, of those learners. So it was very much about how can we improve their lives? And so that made them change their incentive structure for the people who worked in those centers to be around what was the learning that was gained by the people that came into the centers. And that totally shifted any, everything. It transformed the productivity, the morale, um, as well as, of course, delivering on the purpose and uh, bringing better results to the learners. So that's, a, I think, really one, one example. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and any other sort of comments on tangible concrete targets and how you overlay, overlay those on traditional metrics? Oh, sorry, me. Uh, um, well, there's a lot of work being done in that area. I mean, obviously, we we already have lots of progress around. Um, so, so there's a difference between um, organisational specific targets, and I know some organisations might, for example, when they're going on a purpose journey, they might have their traditional targets and then bring in almost in parallel purpose-driven targets and then live with that tension and use that tension to work out where the issues in the organizations you know where, where that is so that's one approach um, there um, there's an and, and I'd say in the realm of saying you know what are the the sort of targets that might be shared across organizations so we can start to benchmark performance in this area I think that's a really emerging area at the moment and I think we should expect to see a lot of a lot coming out of that that draws on all of the great work around sustainability targets, sustainable development goals, SDGs, um, and brings that together. So um, I think, yeah, it's it's an emerging and interesting area. Super, and and perhaps um, related, well, definitely related to that. Actually, another question that we've had come through the webinar is um, how it related to the B Corp accreditation. So obviously, that's something that's emerged over recent years. So, so Ben, your thoughts on that question, how effective do you think B Corp accreditation is in achieving the aspirations that we've talked about today? Yeah, I think in a, in a couple of ways. So one of the significant things that B Corp does is it requires um, a, a profit beyond, uh, sorry, purpose beyond profit to be part of the articles of the business, which is a significant mm -hmm. step. And, and there's a lot of a bit exploration in corporate governance code at the moment, and there's an, even a movement that all listed companies should have a statement of purpose. So that's the first thing it does, it enshrines it in law with, with B Corp. The second thing is that I think they've got fantastic criteria which help the business really think through robustly how it's adding value to society and beyond. So it's a great framework for businesses to do that. I think where it's um, typically been adopted by more smaller values-led startup businesses, but it's definitely going increasingly mainstream. So famously Danone have accredited its European business and is looking elsewhere. And I know there are other big multinationals that are looking at the criteria to help them think through um, how they can be sustainable in the future. So I think it's it's definitely part of the movement. It's very powerful. They've also um, done a really interesting piece of work at the moment, helping organisations respond to the climate crisis. And they have what they call a playbook. That's further work they've been doing. But I think it's one of a number of tools, it's not the only way. There are other there are other frameworks out there 
not least the sustainable development goals, but also future fit business framework. There are other tools to help businesses think through how they can be resilient and relevant in the future. Yeah, super. Great. Thank you for that. So I want to, to move on to a question that actually is, is a common theme that we often um, sort of come up, this idea of you know, how, how do you lead from wherever you are in the organisation? Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the, the question that we specifically had was, um, from someone on the webinar just now, is how can the cogs in a bigger machine, e.g. more junior employees, drive change in purpose? Mm. So inter interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think if you're in one of those big you know, companies that are in that sort of treated like a machine, run like a machine, it's important to be realistic about, about that. Having said that, I think it's, it, what can really help is be really clear about where your boundaries of control and influence lie. And often people can underestimate their boundary of influence in particular. So of course, there are lots of things you can be doing within, you know, say with your team, with your direct reports. Um, for example, Triodos Bank, um, they have meetings at the beginning of every day to think about how are actions today going to uh, activate purpose? Well, if you haven't got a purpose, you could still ask that question. You could say, for example, use the sustainable development goals yeah. and say, how, do, how can we contribute to the sustainable development goals, for example? Um, and I think the other thing is using questions is really powerful of those around you, both with peers, with senior managers, and a lot of the businesses I work with, one of the main reasons they're looking at this is to attract and motivate talent. So, and one of the really interesting insights from the Edelman recent uh, research um, was that people actually trust their employer. It has one of the highest ratings of trust. So there's a really important relationship there. So I think it's, so people shouldn't underestimate the influence they can have. Brilliant. No, thank you for that. And, and actually, Victoria, I, I want to give you an opportunity to jump in. So a slightly different question that we got in advance of the webinar was, uh, do you have thoughts on how you can begin to identify purpose and meaning at an individual level? Um, yeah, um, I think that's, yeah, quite similar. Um, I'd say my, my response to that would be similar to what I, I mentioned just before. So probably, you know, really trying to focus in on your um, on your personal, what, what matters to you, not just so that you can then change jobs and uh, try and make your organization fit that, but so that you can really try and understand what, how you are as a meaningful human being and what it feels like to do to, 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 to produce meaning and then be able to think through the work that you do on a daily basis and the meaningful impacts that it's having that you might not have noticed yet. And if you can think about those, whilst you're doing that work, you're going to be more motivated with what you're doing and you're going to be more attuned to your individual drive for purpose. Great, thank you. Um, now there's an expression that we've managed to avoid so far on this uh, webinar, but it's um, kind of snuck in through the questions, which is purpose wash. And one of the questions that we had was, is there a risk that purpose is the new greenwash? And actually uh, another question that we had, which is related, and, and then I'll get Ben's thoughts on this first is, um, is there a danger that sort of purposeful leadership is, is a sort of transient fashion? So, so Ben, is, is this a fad and how do we avoid purpose wash? There you go, I've said it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for those aren't familiar with the idea, that in the same way that you had uh, greenwash was this idea that companies making great environmental or sustainability claims without backing them up, the same can be true of purpose. I mean, I think there's a huge risk of that. And that's one of the reasons I think I'm really passionate about integrating purpose with sustainability because I think it's one of two ways in which you, you avoid that risk. So the first is by not diluting these concepts and thinking robustly about how the business can provide real value to society within the environmental limits into the future. And if you're doing that and, and your products and services are delivering that, that's got to be credible. I think the second piece is around really ensuring that it's embedded well in the business, you know, really integrating mm -hmm. decisions at all levels. Um, and, and that, as, as Victoria said, is a, is a long and deliberate journey for an organisation to go on. Um, and that, as long as you're not overclaiming along the way, then I think there's huge potential in the, per, in the movement, if you like, to create businesses that are genuinely delivering that, that, that sort of outcomes. And we know they have to engage in the systems around them because they will come up against powerful external you know, dynamics that might limit it. So I think there's yeah, a huge potential for the positives, but there is also a potential for getting this really wrong if we don't anchor it into business and sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I'd say is revisit this webinar because there is an awful lot of great advice 
and guidance in here to actually make sure that we're not getting into uh, the new types of greenwash. Um, Victoria, I just want to give you an opportunity to come in and, and comment um, if you have, if you want to. If not, I'll go on to some other questions. Um, yeah, just to underline, I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to really pin down that definition, because once we're clear what it is, then organisations can be held to account for it. And I think that's really critical. But not everything about purpose will be able to be held to account to a figure on a spreadsheet and a, and a percentage mark. So it really is, is an art and um, it's going to require all stakeholders to hold organisations to account. Um, ultimately, some of that will end up in legislation and regulation, and we certainly need change there. But that will never drive the deep culture change we need. So it's really about everyone being part of saying, no, this is too precious as a concept to let slip to be another trend. Because honestly, if we don't grab purpose and implement it, I, I can't see anything else on the horizon that is going to be able to transform business as we need to. There you go. I think that's a mic drop. <laughs> Just 10 minutes early. Um, okay, so just carrying on through the questions. So um, we we had a, a question um, with regard to um, whether the learnings uh, and the guidance in this weather webinar only apply only to business, uh, big business, or um, how they also apply to um, SMEs, NGOs, public sector. So would would welcome a comment from from one or either of you on that. I, I could kick off with something short, if if only because yeah. this is something very very passionate. <laughs> because um, and one of the reasons we called it organisational purpose is um, is because really this is a concept that that, that spans all organisations. Um, I, I personally don't understand um, the definite you know the, the difference between profit and not for profit when we look at it you have a system you know resources go in business model happen and things go out whether your money comes from donors or from customers you know the system is the same um, so really this concept is the same a lot of it's borrowing and, and learning from maybe that some of the social sectors beforehand but that's not to say that because you're in a social sector you're purpose driven and I think one of the main benefits of it coming into the uh, what would be traditionally the uh, the, the traditional for-profit uh, place is that there's cross-learning that can be done around what do we really mean by this and how do we really do deliver well-being for the long term. Great, fantastic. And, and I absolutely agree with that. I just I think to, to add that I think it's absolutely relevant that um, because NGOs, public sectors we know are under huge strain, huge changes, they're facing into all the same challenges that business are. But in a similar way that for business, it will look different depending on how regulated it is, how big it is, how dynamic the space is. So what was happening in tech is very different to what's happening in the energy sector in a similar way. So I think that absolutely it's relevant and you need to work. But I think that whole idea of how are you, again, resilient and, you know, and relevant in the future and then working back from that to say what contribution you're making is still just as essential for whichever sector you're in. Yeah. And of course, we're also seeing blurring between the sectors. Right. So actually, we, we don't have these hard lines anymore, and that's a good thing because we need to be collaborating across silos to be coming up with new solutions. And, and this was just picking up that point. I think we are at an unusual point in history where there is this astonishing alignment between the sectors, actually, between what government, what NGOs, and even businesses now. I think we're probably at a more aligned period of history probably than we have done for some time now. Yeah, and civil society, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, okay, um, so we've got a, a few minutes left and um, a, a nice big juicy one for you here, Ben. Um, so is profitability still a marker of success? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so this is obviously a, a key question. I, I, building on what Victoria said, um, so Simon Sinek, a great thinker in this area, talks about the analogy of fuel in a car. He said, profit is like fuel. Without it, the car won't go anywhere, but you don't get in the car to drive to the petrol station. You know, and I think that's a great analogy. The reality is that our capital markets and external reporting on, on financial reporting is set up to look at purely financial um, value. The reality is it's not telling us at the moment, I think, what other forms of value creation are going on there. So it tells us a company's how much money it's made, but it doesn't tell you how it made it or its ability to make into the future. And I think as investors, like through the um, increasingly waking up to both the risks and increasing the opportunities of businesses that have really thought through their resilience, their value creation model into the future. And particularly around this is tied into the whole area of understanding intangible assets, but also understanding what natural and social assets you're both drawing on. And at the moment, that's not really appearing on balance sheets at all. 
And so, so I think that yes, it's an important part of success, but increasingly what purpose helps us to do is unpack how that's linked to other forms of value creation that are needed to support the profit um, mm. profit value creation as well. Brilliant, fantastic. Yeah, I'll tell that something that you think, feel very passionately about. Mm. Victoria, I'm gonna hand over to you for the, the final question. I, and I know that you've got something you want to add here, uh, which will just leave me a, a couple of minutes to wrap up and, and, and say what's coming next. So, so Victoria, um, just just a question for you in terms of that we had in advance was, do we make a decision to become a purposeful leader or is there a maturity process that one goes through? And if so, please can I have it? <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Victoria, just to sort of finish off the, the, the questions here? And we can't hear you, so you might still be on mute. Victoria, we're not we're not hearing you here, but maybe some other people are. Ah, uh, Zoe. Okay, I lost sound. I'm, I'm back yeah, again back. now. Yeah, fantastic. Welcome back. Okay, so the question. Uh, could you just remind me? Sure. Yeah. So, sort of final final point on this. So, um, we had a question. Do you make a decision to become a purposeful leader? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting point. Um. Yeah. I I think. Uh. Yes. I would say you do. Um, because it is a it's a a skill to be able to lead purposefully to know yourself well enough to be a purposeful leader and to lead others and to understand how you're operating in context so I think you do need to decide and learn and and, and go on that journey absolutely um, and I think the point at which you decide that um, is probably a shift from when you're thinking about how do I optimize the meaning I feel in the work I do, which I talked about earlier, um, and, and how can I feel, feel more meaningfully about my work, to saying, how can we actually optimize the outcomes for others? So not just how can I connect with what I do for others, but how can I expand that so that I can impact the well-being and that long-term well-being for all meta frame what can i do how can i change my organization how can i change myself and how can i work with others to deliver that um to the maximum uh, in the period of time that i've got with the skills that i have and i think that is the, the real shifting point brilliant thank you well well thank you um, i think that's a, a super point on which to end so I would um, firstly just like to flag that our next webinar in this series is on the 7th of October and we're looking at leadership development in the 21st century and then we're going to squeeze one more in um, before the end of the year. So, so stay with us on this leadership webinar series. Um, but before we finish, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us on the webinar for being with us today. We know that you're joining us from many parts of the world and many of you are not existing within our network before so welcome secondly i'd like to thank um ben ben kellard thank you very much for joining me Pleasure. and also victoria hearth thank you very much in joy for joining me too this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website along with all our webinars in the series